Hello everyone. So our topic of discussion for today is the factors facilitating the learning. Coming to the first one, continuous versus the partial reinforcement. In the continuous reinforcement, you know, the organism is reinforced at every single trial. You know, so after every, uh, so to say, the response that's made by the organism, you know, uh, the organism will be reinforced, of course. That's what is essentially happening in continuous reinforcement. There is no breakage, you know, for every trial, for every response, the organism will be given the reinforcement. And suddenly when the reinforcement is withdrawn, you know, the response which was actually acquired by the organism also tends to extinct or it sort of extinguishes, you know, very, very rapidly. You know, whereas when we talk about uh, the partial or the intermittent uh, reinforcement, here sometimes, uh, you know, for some, of course, responses, the organism is reinforced and maybe for some, the organism is not. So that sort of curiosity, that sort of hope is still maintained in the organism that, you know, I will be uh, reinforced for this particular response. So we cannot say that the quiet response very rapidly sort of uh, extinguishes or it gets very it gets uh, sort of extinct very easily, you know, no, essentially, um, it does not uh, extinct, you know, the acquired response does not extinct very, very quickly or immediately, uh, you know, it, it is still there, you know, because of the curiosity maintained, because of that kind of hope maintained, you know, so definitely we can say that uh, the responses, you know, which are acquired under the partial reinforcement, you know, they are basically highly resistant to ex extinction. Because in case of partial or intermittent uh, uh, reinforcement, you know, basically, uh, it's sometimes very difficult to say whether, you know, the reinforcement has been permanently discontinued, or maybe, uh, you know, it has just been delayed, and it will be coming or arriving very soon, you know, but in case of continuous reinforcements, you know, it's, it's rather, you know, easy to say that, yes, now the reinforcement has been discontinued, it has been, uh, you know, withdrawn. So that is why, you know, uh, extinction, if we see in case of uh, continuous reinforcement, the extinction of response is very rapid. But in case of the partial reinforcement, the extinction of response, essentially, you know, it's very difficult. It doesn't happen that quickly, it doesn't happen that rapidly. You know, so this is what uh, was all about the continuous versus the partial reinforcement. When we talk about motivation, motivation essentially is a mental as well as a physiological state, you know. And this motivation actually arouses an organism to act for fulfilling the current need. So in order to fulfill our basic needs, yes, we do need that motivation. We need to be motivated enough so that we can take action to fulfill those needs. So yes, motivation also is a very, very important factor that facilitates, you know, learning. So motivation, what essentially does is that it, it will actually energize the organism to act very, very vigorously for attaining some kind of goal. If, for instance, we just take example of that hungry rat, so if that hungry rat, you know, it's let's say is placed in a box, the animal will actually um, keep running around searching, literally exploring, searching, you know, in the box for food, you know, and uh, it so happens that, uh, you know, uh, very, very accidentally, he sort of presses the lever and the food actually drops in the box. And uh, with repeated experience of such activity, you know, eventually we'll notice that the animal will learn to press the lever, you know, very, very quickly, uh, you know, right after the animal is placed in the box. So it is the motivation only, which is actually propelling, you know, this animal to search for food, to exhibit this um, exploratory behavior, to look around, to search for food. If the rat wasn't motivated enough, probably the rat wouldn't have taken that action, sort of to fulfill the basic need, you know, uh, the survival need of, uh, you know, the biological need of hunger. 
you know so yes it's very important that everything essentially begins with motivation and yes motivation is a very very important factor of or to sort of facilitate the learning now coming to preparedness for learning very important so here when we talk about uh, preparedness uh, you know preparedness essentially here refers to the biological preparedness you know and uh, biological preparedness is the idea that uh, a lot of uh, and that goes for all of us that people and animals you know uh, they are inherently you know uh, inclined you know um, to form associations between certain stimuli and responses so inherently means that in a way that this is already present in each one of us from the beginning you know so yes this biological preparedness sort of tells us that uh, we are very inherently inclined to form associations between certain stimuli and response you know so uh, when we talk about these associations which are being formed between certain stimuli and uh, you know responses these associations they are forming easily because we are actually predisposed to form such connections you know while other associations are much more difficult to form because we are not naturally predisposed to form them so uh, when we talk about uh, you know uh, for being of course uh, like uh, literally inherently possessing such form of uh, uh, processes within us you know so uh, it's very easy to say that uh, uh, you know like uh, there are certain uh, associations you know which we tend to form and we are naturally predisposed to form those you know so predisposed in a way means that you know uh, you know like uh, literally how we are liable quite inclined you know naturally inclined to do that you know it's quite predictable also that this is what we will do so in case of such uh, 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 you know uh, biological preparedness if we come to see yes some associations you know we uh, are but you know liable to form such kind of connections you know and um, some of the connections we don't really form between the stimuli and the response also because you know we are not uh, naturally inclined or uh, liable to form those kind of connections you know so um, for instance let us just take example you know of uh, understanding this uh, biological uh, preparedness you know uh, let's just take example of certain types of phobias you know uh, which we tend to form very easily you know because we are we probably could be phobic of something or the other and that sort of very instinctively or sort of very naturally or uh, uh, inherently probably can be there in us you know so we tend to uh, you know uh, develop a fear of things that may pose a threat to our survival like it could be heights spiders snakes you know uh, those who learn to fear such dangers more readily were more likely to survive in uh you know probably uh uh you know like be more cautious you know so uh that's what biological preparedness is all about that you know we are in a way uh, very inherently uh inclined or predisposed you know to form associations between certain stimuli and responses so uh that is sort of uh, you know we are inclined to make such kind of connections and that is present in us you know from the very beginning you know and even if it comes to these fears and phobias probably they are very much present in us you know and why do we do that is also because you know uh, we probably want to be safe enough or we want to kind of uh, you know like take care of maybe our survival needs you know so many phobia objects involve things that potentially they tend to basically pose a threat to safety and well-being like you know snakes spiders 
heights and all these things can probably be very uh, potentially very very deadly dangerous so biological preparedness in a way what it does is that you know people will form uh, you know they tend to form fear associations you know uh, with sort of these threatening options you know and because of that fear which they have formed they will actually avoid people will tell, tend to avoid the possible dangers you know and why are they trying to avoid because they want to basically make it very very easy for themselves to survive you know and um, you know so basically these people they are more likely to survive and take care of themselves so uh, it's it's very natural that they will have children and they probably will also pass down this kind of gene you know into their children children also that probably will contribute to this kind of fear you know so essentially this is what is happening in biological preparedness so in short we can say that uh, in biological preparedness you know the kind of associations which are which you are forming between the stimuli and the response you know um those are very much present in you from the beginning inherently in you you know uh, you are like in a way predisposed to such kind of associations you are liable to make such kind of associations you are inclined to make such kind of associations whether it could be by literally looking at a snake or could be standing uh, you know on the top of a hill and then probably making a response to sort of avoid it to run away or to shut your eyes or to hold somebody somebody tightly all these responses that you are making to these dangerous or deadly stimuli which in your eyes could be very very fearful again this is something which we cannot generalize for everybody here we've taken an example of people who are scared of uh, certain or particular animals heights who have certain phobias you know so they will obviously make a response to these kind of deadly stimuli and the response that they make could be some kind of fearful response you know so there is a tendency in them of having this fear you know towards these particular things and uh, this kind of fear which is already inherently present in them you know which is in a way making them uh, prepared biologically beforehand to meet these uh, dangerous uh, or deadly stimuli this kind of fear can actually pass on you know to their children also you know uh you know through their gen genes basically through the genetics and uh, probably can contribute to the fear uh, responses then which probably their children will make so biological preparedness is all of that you know how are you biologically uh, you know like uh, prepared to meet uh, certain situations you know what sort of associations you are inherently making you know which are present in you from the beginning towards particular stimuli so it's all about the uh, uh, associations essentially you know like uh, the ss or the sr associations you know so yes this is all what uh, is there in case of preparedness for learning you know and uh, this very clearly helps us to understand that uh, you know like uh, one can learn uh, uh you know uh, only those associations for which one is genetically prepared you know so you have to be literally genetically prepared for it so that essentially what is the biological preparedness genetically you're prepared for it because yes there are so many things that we tend to genetically inherit from our parents also so and that probably will differ you know from person to person also essentially so these were the three very important factors that uh, facilitate learning thank you so much